What I wanted to talk about was, uh, I think this is uh, Steve Manis' influence. He really likes statistics, so, uh, and he really particularly, I think, likes people taking statistics apart. And um, so maybe I'll start uh, just to relax myself from my horror at not having my PowerPoint presentation and tell a story which is right up the alley of, of what uh, Wayne just told us about, which was that, um, and it's also chapter 10 of my book, which you will all want to read. Um, and it's in 2012, I think, we, I was going for a bike ride with my partner, Pierre, in Peru, and we love biking. We do lots and lots of biking, and we were biking up to the top of this uh, mountain in, in Peru, and, and it was absolutely gorgeous, a uh, beautiful day, warm, and a dog came out of the side of the road and bit Pierre in the leg, and it was a huge bite with blood pouring down his leg. And I was, we were all terrified, and we tried to catch the dog, but the kids who had the dog were no fools, and so they ran, taking the dog with them, and we never found the dog. Well, rabies is not a pleasant disease. You die from it. And so the question was, did Pierre need to get rabies shots? And rabies shots are not fun. You get a needle stuck in your tummy, and you have to have a series, it turns out, at least the way they do things in Peru, you have to have a series of seven shots, which means you have to stay in the same place for seven days because they have socialized medicine and the people pay for it, not rich Canadians, but, but real people. And the, when they pay for it, they pay for breaking open a stock of seven doses for the seven days. So you can't go from one city where the seven doses are to, uh, and break open a, a bunch of seven doses, and then the next city break open another bunch of seven doses that the people are going to pay for, right? So we had to decide, did we really need to get uh, Pierre these rabies shots? So what were we going to base ourselves on? Um, there was uh, an extensive program of prevention of rabies in Peru. All the dogs everywhere had been protected, had been shot. Uh, there had been no case re of rabies reported for uh, a couple of years in Peru. So probably there wasn't any rabies. So uh, we thought about this commonly. We also communicated with Pierre's daughter, who happens to be a physician, a public health physician. And she said, probably a chance in a thousand that he's going to get rabies. And so we said, We'll just go on with our holiday, chance in a thousand. And in the middle of the night, I woke up and I burst into tears. I just cried and cried and cried. I thought, oh my God, this wonderful life, these, all these wonderful bike trips, I'm not going to be able to do them anymore. Pierre's going to be dead of rabies. <laughs> and we got the rabies shot. I was not leaving <laughs> until we got the seven rabies shots getting stuck in the stomach. So that was my way of living. And, and all the time that I was doing this, I was thinking of the, of the worker who uh, is in the post office, which is one of the worst wor places in the world to work, um, taking, uh, uh, I think it's 30 packages, 31 kilogram packages off the line here, picking them up, scanning the postal code, and putting them in there. And the fact that when we are going to prove that her shoulder problems, which are, uh, which she are making her disabled, when we're going to prove that that's due to her work, we have to be sure at not one time in a thousand, but 95% sure. Okay? And so my desire as a rich Canadian to protect my partner from a risk of one in a thousand, the wife of some worker or the husband of some worker who's having perhaps a life-threatening disease, for them to get that person protected, they have to be 95% sure, not 1%, not one in a thousand, 95% sure. And this seems somehow pretty unfair. So that was my illustration of that point. The second thing I wanted to bring up about that is and I really had some nice slides about it, <laughs> is that 
people, we are talking always about that 95% confidence interval. What does it mean? It means that we uh, want to be sure that we don't go overboard in protecting people. We only want to protect people if we have less than one chance in 20 of being wrong in protecting them, okay? We want to make sure we're overwhelmingly convinced that there's a danger before we start protecting them. And that's the number that gets reported in these scientific studies Wayne has been talking about. That number of 0.05, it's, it's, it's got a fancy name which is alpha, and it's, it's reported in all the scientific papers. Well, we did a little study to see whether the other risk was being reported. What's the other risk? The other risk is missing something, missing a danger. What happens <coughs> if we're looking at all these data and there's some horrible thing going on? What's our chance of missing that? And that, that, that thing has a name also. <coughs> it's called beta. And it's a chance of being wrong in saying that something isn't dangerous. Okay? So if you want to minimize alpha, you do it for the company. If you want to minimize beta, you do it for the worker. Okay? Is that clear? And if it isn't, I'm going to be very delighted to explain it all over again. Because you would have really understood it if the, you had been able to see my original slide. So there's a chance that the company is going to have to pay unnecessarily. There's a chance that the worker's not going to get compensated and that that's going to be a mistake. Alpha is the chance that the company is going to have to pay when they shouldn't, and beta is the chance that the worker is going to get compensated when they shouldn't. Alpha is usually set at 0.05, okay, very small chance. Beta is usually set at 0.2. Explain this to me. Okay. Four times higher, a weight of four times more on the worker than on the company. Who decided this? I don't, I don't think we know. The story about the 0.05, you, you probably heard this, is that Fisher, who was the, the, the father of statistics, supposedly, somebody asked him, at what percent we should make a decision that something is dangerous? And he said, I don't know, you know, because they can calculate all these percentages, but deciding what's important was not a statistical question. And then Fisher went home, supposedly is this his story, and he got into his bath, and he, he was lying there looking at his toes, and he said, 5%. Now, if you look at the, both feet, workers would be better off. They would be twice as well off. <laughs> if he had had a pet two-toed sloth and looked at the pet two-toed sloth feet, then workers would be a lot worse off. But there's really no more sense than that in this 5%. And there's certainly no more sense than that in the 20%. So, what, and the other thing about the 20% is that when with my buddies, I went and looked to see what the journal articles were publishing. They're not even publishing that 20% thing. They're not publishing the chances they're missing something. Usually. Three papers out of 20, I think, published them. So, and the other thing that we found about out when we looked at all that literature is that we had, we had taken half of our papers that we looked at from a journal that is pretty nasty. Uh, it's, being, it's always being uh, denounced by progressive scientists. It's called the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Medicine. And what it is, is a <coughs> journal of the Association of Company Doctors. And so we had the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Medicine, and we had the American Journal of Industrial Medicine, which is nice people, people we like, people that are our friends, people that publish us, uh, people that are friends to unions, a place where unions can get papers published. But in the way they treated the data, there was no difference in the publications in the worker-friendly journal and the company-friendly journal. Why is that? That's because we all got brought up to do science in a certain way. We got brought up to do all the scientists that got PhDs. We were told that what's important is alpha. What's important is minimizing the risk of being wrong if you say something's dangerous. 
We were also told that if you want to do, have alpha be 0.05, if you want to minimize the chance of <coughs> making, uh, saying something's dangerous when it isn't, you can't at the same time minimize the chance of missing something dangerous unless you have enormous sample sizes. This is just the way statistics works. So if you have to choose, you're going to choose being conservative. Now this word conservative um, has a lot of meaning, particularly this week. Um, <laughs> we, be, be, being conservative can be a good thing sometimes. Uh, and, and what, but what it means in this particular instance is not saying something is dangerous until you're really, really sure. But being conservative in this sense doesn't mean being very, very sure before you say something's not dangerous. So what I'm saying here is that there's a lot of mechanisms in the scientific literature for making sure that companies don't have to pay out unless we're really sure they better pay out. On top of that, we had an experience as, as scientists, and, and some, uh, some of the people in my group were actually testifying in hearings for compensation, where the judge said, well, I've read this paper that was written by a scientist, and the scientist is saying that repetitive work isn't really dangerous. So we look at the paper. Who wrote the paper? The paper's written by a woman, woman named Barbara Silverstein. Who's Barbara Silverstein? She was the head of ergonomics for the United States for a while. And she was setting up ergonomics laws. And everybody was against her. But she was really fighting to have an ergonomic standard so that people would, uh, their musculoskeletal problems would be protected. Uh, she worked on it for years and years. She got hate mail, she got death threats because there were a lot of people in manufacturing that were not happy with the idea that the workers in the United States would be protected. She finally got hounded out of Washington and she went home to her home in Washington State and where she got an ergonomics um, law passed there uh, that protected workers. There was a tremendous backlash from companies. They uh, abrogated the laws. She then spent the rest of her, uh, the next few years writing papers about all the terrible things, all the good things that had happened when they had the laws and all the terrible things that were starting to happen once they didn't have the laws anymore. I mean, this is not a woman who has a neutral position on whether repetitive work causes musculoskeletal problems. This is a woman who knows very well and has made the good fight for getting that link recognized. But when she wrote her papers, she said things like, uh, based on our results, we think that the repetitive uh, strain may be associated with uh, the particular musculoskeletal problem with, I think it was, carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, and it would be important to uh, validate, validate this uh, relationship in further studies. And it will be important to also to uh, uh, try prevention programs. She didn't say, get out there tomorrow morning, get on this right away, you don't, don't be slackers, we want to see you on the assembly line, slowing it down right now, because scientists don't write like that. We're not taught to write like that. We're taught never to say, this is linked to that. We're taught always to say, I can't rule out a relationship between, we just talk like that. And if we see something that isn't written like that, it makes us very uncomfortable. Me too. If I, if, if I read a paper that said, go out right now, tomorrow morning, and stop uh, people moving uh, 31 pound, one kilogram packages from here to there every, uh, every second, or it can't be every second, one a second, every 30 seconds. If I read a, a paper that said that, I would think that person wasn't a scientist, because that's not how scientists talk. And so the judge in this particular case that we were looking at said, well, even the author doesn't believe that there's this link. And so the, the judge threw out the case. And these were these people who were really, really, I mean, it's three women at the same position with the same musculoskeletal problem, with the same exposure. Come on, you know, we knew that this was, this was related. But when you read the paper that's related to that, 
It doesn't say, it, uh, the language is not strong because we're taught to speak in this, in this particular way. So what I want to say to you about that is it's really important to educate us scientists about how to speak. And, and I think uh, Wayne is making a very good point, is that as long as you're only writing for the scientific literature, we're not going to change the rules for how the scientific literature gets, um, gets written. In fact, when I presented the, my point of view on this, we got the nicest, most progressive scientists came down really hard on us for, say, for even saying this thing about the language because they said we were saying that uh, scientists should be less tentative in what they're saying and what that would do is that progressive scientists would be looked at as worse scientists. Those people who said right out that workers were getting injured and without you know, putting in all the fancy language about they might be in sometimes and, and all this, would look like worse scientists and would be in a worse position to defend workers. Okay, so we're not gonna change the science the literature. And that's a really, really good reason for doing the kinds of publications that you're doing and the, the, the book that I wrote and so forth, where we can speak to a certain extent from our hearts and say, well, this is what I really think. You know, you can read my papers if you want to know what I might be about to be thinking about, maybe. But if you really want to know what I think, you can read my book. Okay. $20. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that was the first story I wanted, I wanted to tell. The second story I wanted to tell is about what happens to progressive science, at least in Quebec. Uh, and give me a five minute warning. We had the experience in, in Quebec of Ecotest. Uh, Ecotest is the Enquête uh, Québécoise sur les con des conditions de travail et la santé et la sécurité du travail. It was a big um, uh, questionnaire that was put out to 5,000 people, half women, half men. Uh, and it was the work of 22 different scientists from, I think it was 10 different institutions, that's all on my slide. And we worked for about two to three years just getting the questions right. We wanted to be sure that the questions had been used before, that everybody knew that they were valid, that they got good responses. Um, and so we put the questionnaire together. We had professionals calling people up and getting them to answer it. We then uh, divided the, uh, the answers into nine topics, and then this became nine chapters, and each team of PhDs, there were three or four PhDs with each, each chapter, uh, summarized the results. Then those results were sent to a committee. The committee um, was the scientific committee of our um, research. It's sort of the equivalent of IWH, it's called IRSST, and it has what's called a scientific board, which is composed of employer representatives, union representatives, and uh, people from the government. It's not really a scientific board, it's really a political board. And this political board looked at each chapter, sent it out to each of their pet scientists, from, therefore from both the employer side and from the worker side. Those people went over each chapter with a fine tooth comb. They made a many billion trillion corrections, and I know this because I was uh, an author of three chapters. Um, and, uh, and they made us say things much more tentatively than we would have said them. And finally, the whole thing was accepted, and we sent it to the Ministry of Labor because it was a government commission report. And for a year, it sat on the minister's desk, or anyway, it disappeared into whatever they have in Quebec City that, that eats up pieces of paper. And for a year, nothing happened, and we couldn't figure out what was going on. And at the end of a year, at on um, September, I think it was around September 9th, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the report was re released. So at the end of the day, when it was kind of too late to be in any of the major stories, it was released. And at 10 o'clock the next morning, the uh, employer organization, the Conseil du Patronat, denounced it. Okay? They were on all the committees that led up to this report. And they said it was worthless, it wasn't scientific. 
They, and what, why did they do this? Well, one of the, of course they didn't say what was particularly offensive to them, although I'll tell you a little story about that too. Um, <clears throat> but what we think that, that they were offended by was a little statistic that was in chapter seven that said that of the people who had an employment related injury and lost time um, due to this employment related injury, a musculoskeletal injury, only one in five ever made a claim. So there was, there was drastic under, under claiming for musculoskeletal disorders in Quebec. And the reason I think that this was what got them upset was that a couple months later, I was presenting something at a meeting, and it was an open meeting. And I heard the, the employer representative, the representative from this organization that denounced the report, get up and say, <clears throat> you know what they had for a question about musculoskeletal problems in this, in this uh, eco-test uh, questionnaire? It was, do you sometimes have a pain somewhere? That's such a vague question. Of course, everybody has a pain somewhere. Luckily, I was in the audience, and I got up, and I said, well, no, actually, that wasn't the question that was asked. The question that was asked, we gave them a picture of the human body. We said, would you please check any place on this picture where you have had pain uh, all the time, or almost all the time, over the last 12 months that has interfered with your daily activities in an important way? Okay? That was the question that was about the puzzle. So I got up, and I thought that this poor fellow was going to fall, you know, sink into the floor. He wasn't bothered by this at all. Not only he wasn't bothered by it at all, but two months later, I was in another meeting where, with, with other people from this organization, not the same guy, but another, and two other people, and we were talking about uh, compensation and, and the results of this uh, eco-test survey. And a woman from the, the same organization got and she said, you know what the question is on the questionnaire? It says, do you ever have pain sometimes somewhere? Isn't that a really vague question? <laughs> so it was clearly a campaign that they were running to make it look like this. So what, I, what my message is here is there are good scientists and progressive scientists and people who would like to make workers' lives easier. It's probably important that people who are wanting to make workers' lives easier in daily life, that they learn to identify truth and falsehood in the area of, uh, of uh, musculoskeletal disorders or any other work-related disorders, that you learn to identify which scientists are on your side and which are not, that you make it clear to the scientists what you need them for, what, how you need them to communicate. You also make it clear to them, to us, that when we go into court, we're looking for a burden of proof and not a 95% certainty because we're very confused about that. The idea of a burden of proof is not something that's familiar to us, uh, to us at all. We don't work with burden of proof. We work with 0.05 chances of being wrong. That's not the same thing as a 50% or more burden of proof. So yeah, we, we need you to explain these things to us. And so Five the minutes. last thing, okay, wow, am I great? Because this is the perfect <laughs> timing. I was just gonna do the last five minutes. And that is what we need in order for, for you to be able to tell us these things is we need lines of commu communications. And so I do wanna spend the last few minutes telling about the kind of situation we have at the University of Quebec and how helpful that's been to us. Because for the last, since 1976, however long that is, it's got to be close to 50 years then? No, 40 maybe? 40, 40 years. Um, there's been a formal agreement between uh, the University of Quebec and three major Quebec unions. And it provides that if the unions need uh, <coughs> training or if they need research projects, they can ask the university for resources to, to do these things and the university will provide the resources, provide uh, a little seed funding, provide, um, uh, I can't even know whatever that is, English uh, orientation uh, for the scientists. So for example, uh, if the union wants me to train 
16 groups of, of hospital workers in lifting techniques, because I'm an ergonomist, then they give that request to the university. The university uh, will have a committee look at it and see if it's, a, if it's scientifically, you know, the kind of thing the university should be doing. Uh, it then goes to a committee that says, uh, is it worth it to us uh, to free up Karen from 45 hours of teaching a university course in order that she do this? And if they decide, which they always do, that yes it is, then I get forgiven a course and instead I go out and teach that course. So it's, it means my life is a heck of a lot easier than a lot of other people who, who are doing training of workers and in unions. It's a formal relationship which means that there's a certain guarantee of quality. And the other thing is that there's seed money. So that we got a request from the union that said that their work schedules were horrible and what could we do about this. We went and got $8,000 from, from the university to start a little project. Because we had that $8,000, we were able to write a report and a grant application. We now have 200,000 smackaroos mm -hmm. to continue that uh, work with the union and we have just uh, submitted to them 42 um, ideas for solutions to the scheduling problem, which are now being used in the negotiation process between the union and the employer. And I'm not guaranteeing that, that anybody's going to be better off, but the union really likes it. It is really, really happy with this. That's because I have a wonderful student who does all the work. She, she's wonderful. Um, so what I'm saying to you is that, that unfortunately, this kind of agreement is the only one I know about in Canada. And it would be really cool if they had some in, in Toronto. I know you have IWH, which is really, really useful, but it doesn't have the same freedom that a university professor has. And a place like York University, I would think, would be amenable to the unions really negotiating very hard to get, because how this came about was that the university staff were unionized with the QFL. And a guy from the QFL, who was a very smart man, decided to negotiate this into the contract. So some, you know, it's the kind of thing, I mean, it's in our uh, employment contract that we can do 20, 45 hours of teaching in, in this context instead of 45 hours of class teaching. It's in our contract that there'll be seed money. And the university employs five full-time people to make sure the thing happens. So...